What's up, everyone? Welcome to the PAS Report Podcast. This is your host, Nick Giordano. Make sure that you follow and subscribe to the podcast. Also, visit the PAS Report website, PASReport.com, and share this episode with your family and friends and on social media. I got a great guest coming on today. I have Zeke Arkham coming. He's going to break down what's going on out there, the good, the bad, the ugly. Zeke, welcome to the PAS Report. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm glad to have you on. You, you're someone that is outspoken and you are a veteran police officer. So one of the ways I want to start is why do you think the policing system is broken? I've heard you say it before that the policing system is broken. I'm witnessing it on television every day. And what do we need to do to get back to the concept of law and order? I don't know if uh, the policing system itself is broken. I would say the uh, the legal system, the judicial system is broken. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you have DAs who are seeing themselves more as activists than prosecutors, then that's a problem. You know, when you have a criminal who has been arrested 5, 10, 15, 20 times and he's back on the street because you have a judge who thinks he just deserves a, uh, a warm hug and, and a warm fuzzy, you know, you've got a DA who now wants to uh, circum, you know, put their own interpretation on uh, on pressing charges, and they decide that you know, okay, well, you know, you 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 can do this, but we're really not going to prosecute, you know, or you you can shoplift, but you know, we're we're going to set a thousand dollar limit before we really start to press charges. Criminals are dumb, but they're not dumb at the same time. So if if they figure out really quickly that a DA is not going to prosecute you unless you steal, you know, uh, over a thousand dollars worth of material, then they're going to go in there and they're going to steal $999 worth of material just to make sure that they can walk out with it. And that's what we're seeing now video after video of people walking into different places and they're, they're not even trying to hide their faces anymore or they just say, screw it. And if I steal over a thousand dollars worth of stuff, nothing's going to happen to me anyway. This is what happens when you take away consequences. This is what happens when you take away law and order. And in order to get back to that, we, the people, are going to have to vote better. We're going to have to vote for someone who is better than just, you know, they, they come out and they say the right things or they come out and they promise you that they're going to make things fair. No, it's not about being fair. It's about being just. And sometimes just isn't quote unquote fair because you're going to have to look at who's actually performing the crimes and committing the crimes and take action against them. And that's what we need to get back to. The cops can do their jobs all day. The cops can go out and make the arrest. The cops can go out and incur overtime. You know, you can throw money at the problem and say, okay, well, we're just going to make a, a concentrated effort to hire X amount of cops. And we're going to throw money at the cops so that the cops can perform overtime and do X, Y, and Z. The cops can do their part. It's actually getting the people in jail and keeping them in jail that's going to work. Yeah. And as a police officer, isn't it usually like the same people that are the ones that commit the crimes? It's very rare that you have, you know, the the 50 year old guy that decides that all of a sudden out of nowhere, he's going to go to a life of crime. It's usually going to be a young person and they're usually going to have an arrest record. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I know cops who are filling out prisoner pedigree cards and they don't even have to ask who this person is. They're doing it by memory because they've arrested the person so many times. These are repeat offenders. The cops know who are, who's the people out there doing everything. But like I said, you know, I, I'm hearing stories from cops where they're still processing the arrest. They're still doing the paperwork because the paperwork is so tedious and cumbersome nowadays that they're still doing the paperwork. And the prisoner who they arrested hours ago is walking back into the precinct to pick up their property. You know, how is that possible? How, how, <laughs> how, how is it that, you know, uh, or, or the cop drops a prisoner off at, at central booking or, or wherever they drop, drop them off at. And by the time they're finished doing their paperwork at central booking, they're getting into their cars. And they're watching this guy walk right back out of central booking. You know, it demoralizes the cops. It demoralizes the, uh, the people who want to go out there and see law and order. And it makes them just feel like, oh, well, I'm going to do what I have to do to protect myself and screw everything else. And I, have have... To, I just have to interrupt you a second, because you, the New York City Council has just pushed a measure where they overturned actually a veto by Mayor Eric Adams, where police officers will now have to actually fill out forms for every single interaction they have. So if I, for example, go up to a police officer and ask for direction somewhere, well, now that police officer is going to have to fill out a form. How much does that hurt? 
law enforcement and, and is it does it make our city any safer? Well, I, I never understood why you want to hamstring the cops as much as possible, why you want to make law after law after law, making a, a, a cop's job harder. But then at the same token, you want to take away law after law. That's actually going to put criminals behind bars. I've never understood that reason, that line of thinking. You know, you, you think that criminals just they just need a chance. They just need, you know, if we just give them a chance, if we just show them some love, if we just pat them on the back and tell them everything is going to be OK, you know, they'll turn from their life of crime. No, I, I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, which which was not a very good neighborhood. I saw a lot of crime growing up and criminals decide to be criminals. And there's not much that's going to dissuade them from being criminals uh, aside from you know, one of their partners being shot and killed, or they have some sort of life-changing epiphany. But, you know, lessening the laws and lessening the penalties for crime never convinced a criminal to turn his life around. I don't know any criminal who who has been persuaded to go on a straight and narrow just because some politician somewhere said, hey, we're going to lessen the penalties if, if you go out and perform a crime. I don't know any criminal who has been dissuaded from a life of crime because of that all you're doing is making cops a not want to take the job b transfer to other departments and then c just get out as soon as they can because because the da's and the lawmakers have already decided whose side they're on and it's not the cops absolutely now when we're looking at this whole situation i mean it's actually a push to undo the American identity. America was built upon the idea of, of personal responsibility, choices that we make as individuals. Well, now they want to move the burdens. They want to take the responsibility away from the individual and actually just say, well, it's society's fault. It's racism's fault. It's bigotry's fault. What are your thoughts on that? I've always said the greatest threat to my life is not white supremacy. And I say this as, as a black man that, you know, are you telling me in South Jamaica you never saw the Grand Wizard and the KKK marching down with pillowcases <laughs> on their heads? Absolutely not. I, I did. I did honestly, uh, as, as a class assignment back in I think seventh grade, I had to watch Mississippi Mississippi burning for the first time, and I, I was shocked. I didn't know these kind of things existed. You know, <laughs> so you know, growing up in South Jamaica, Queens. There, I, there were no KKK rallies that I can think of, you know, as <laughs> they weren't marching down the street and burning crosses. I, I didn't even know that kind of thing existed. You know, it, I have family right now who lives in, in one of the projects in New York City. And when I go and visit her, I, I have to walk and I have to make sure I'm carrying as I walk because, you know, there, there's open crime going on. There's open drug dealing. There's garbage on the streets. That's not white supremacy. Some some white supremacist isn't sitting somewhere going, hey, you know what? I'm going to make sure that they're selling drugs in these neighborhoods. I'm going to make sure they're robbing and killing each other in these neighborhoods. I'm going to make sure that that they are directly contributing to the the dirt and the grime where they where they're living. I'm I'm going to directly make sure that this is all happening. White supremacy is not the boogeyman that the left wants you to think it is. It's 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 an excuse. It's a really badly formulated excuse as to why you are where you are. It's not about self accountability. It's not about you actively trying to make yourself better. You know, if you are in the same place you were five years ago, if you're in the same place you were last year, that's your fault. It's not white supremacy. It's not because of the police. It's not because of a judge somewhere. It's not because the system. It's not because systemic racism. No, it's because you didn't get up and make something of yourself. I, that's something I was taught from my grandfather who grew up during a time where there was real racism, where there was real prejudice, where you could say something was systemic and it was happening to you. Nowadays in 2024, that's not the excuse. I hate to break someone's bubble. Actually, I don't hate to break it. I take great joy in breaking <laughs> someone's bubble. That's not the excuse. Well, now I have to ask, I mean, as a black person, have you gotten your black card revoked yet? Because apparently when you say things like that, it's the black face of white supremacy. I mean, like they tried to tag Larry Elder with. How ridiculous is the narrative today? Did you ever envision a time where we'd be this insane in the United States? Well, I just think it's funny. If, if I were a rapper 
and I made songs about killing other black men, if I made songs about having a bunch of baby mamas somewhere, if I had, if I made songs about selling drugs in black neighborhoods, no one would, no one would blink an eye. Snoop Dogg, the majority of his songs are about that, and he's celebrated as a real black man. Jay Z, the majority of his songs are about that, and he's celebrated as a quote unquote real black man. But here I am saying nothing is going to hold you back. Here I am saying the only thing that holds you back is yourself. You look in the mirror, that's the person holding you back. Here I am saying, even if someone shows me racism, I'm not saying racism, individual racism doesn't exist, but I'm saying I don't let it uh, uh, become a barrier towards me. If someone doesn't like me for the color of my skin, I'm going to move around them. I'm going to move through them. I'm going to move over them. I'm going to keep pressing forward until I get to where I want to be. That's my message. And I'm called all kinds of names. I get, I get DMs on, on Twitter every day, people threatening me and t- telling me that that I'm I'm putting the wrong message out there. Well, what about my message is wrong? What am I saying that's so incorrect? That there's no white supremacist boogeyman out there just, just sitting in the corner t- doing things to make you fail? No. This isn't the 1940s. It's not the 1950s or the 60s. It's not even, not even the early part of the 1970s where you could make that excuse and it held some weight. We're here in 2024. We've had a black person quite literally in every aspect and facet of our government making laws. If these people could make it and these people looked at the laws and said, you know what? I'm cool with all this. Then what's your excuse? And I love putting that narrative out there and I haven't found anyone that could really take it down yet. Let me know when someone can. Well, they, they can't take it down because it's just common sense. I mean, you, it's not like this is rocket science that we're talking about. You know, you look at the idea of fatherless homes. So in the ba- black community, it's about 70 percent of fatherless homes. In the white community, it, it's a little bit above 50 percent. In the Hispanic community, it's approaching 50 percent. And then you look at the Asian community and fa- fatherless homes. It's literally down about like 10 percent or 15 percent. It's very, very low. And if we look at who's the most successful in society by median income, it's actually the Asian community over all the other communities. So why is it so wrong to talk about fatherless homes? Why do you get tagged as racist when it's not just blacks that are suffering under fatherless homes? It's a lot of demographics that are. Well, my question is, you know, there, there was there was there was supposedly a study that came out a couple of years ago where someone said that uh, his name, he had a very ethnic name kept him from getting a job. And my answer to that is, well, okay, so you've got someone who comes here from India, who's first generation Indian. His name isn't Bob Smith. (laughs) You know, he's going to have a very ethnic Indian name. Like Vivek Ramaswamy. Like Vivek Ramaswamy, right. Or you've got someone that comes from Southeast Asia. They come from one of the Asian countries in Southeast Asia. They have very ethnic names. Why are they getting the jobs? that you're saying you can't get because you have an ethnic name. It's not about your name. It's not about uh, how it's spelled. It's not about anything else like that. Because when, when I have a, I have a friend who is uh, from Thailand and we had to, we had to figure out his last name because none of us could pronounce it. It's got like 15 constants in a row. <laughs> none, none of us could pronounce it. He, he's a great guy. We all love him to death. We're like, <laughs> you got to help us out with your last name, brother, because none of us can pronounce it. And he's one of the smartest guys I know. And that's because he said his parents weren't concerned about him looking cool or looking fly, looking fresh. His parents weren't concerned with him going out and playing basketball or anything else. His parents told him from day one, you are going to sit and you are going to study. You're going to get into a great high school. You're going to get into a great college. You're going to get a great job after that. And that that's all he knew. I keep telling a lot of people in the black community, I keep telling a lot of people where I grew up. If you had the same mindset, if you sat and said, you know what, you're going to study. It's not going to be about, you know, the the latest song. You know, you're not going to know, you're not going to be listening to the radio and and knowing all lyrics to the latest song. You're going to sit, you're going to study your, you know, your schoolwork, your studies, everything else is going to come before playing basketball, before playing anything else. You're going to sit, you're going to study. You're going to get into a great high school. You're going to get a great job. If you had the same mindset, you would have the same amount of success. And people have problems. They look for reasons why it's like, no, no, no. It, it, you know, they look for more. They spend more energy trying to come up with excuses mm-hmm. as to 
how that's not true rather than it is. And it, it, it's it's frustrating to me because I'm just, you know, I'm saying to them, there's nothing holding you back. And to them, they're all like, yeah, there is something holding me back, but they can't explain how it's holding them back. Or they, they come up with excuses for stuff that happened to people in the 40s. Or they say, oh, well, it's from slavery. Yeah, well, guess what? That excuse is no longer valid. Take your own success in your own hands. And that's just been my message every day. Now, are you starting to notice any changes uh, in the, the communities? I mean, you were someone that you grew up in South Jamaica. Okay, you understand the communities that you serve, in particular through law enforcement. Are you starting to see a mindset where people in these communities are saying, well, the Democrat policies are actually the harmful policies, or are they still, you know, we're Democrats, we're going to vote Democrat, or we're just not going to vote at all? I mean, I think the last election for city council, only 7% of voter turnout, which is absolutely pathetic. So what do you, what is your feeling in the communities? Honestly, I, I think it's about the same. I, I think people are so just uh, disenchanted well, with the depressing. government. No, I, and that's, that's just being completely honest. I think it's about the same. I think people are just so disenchanted with the government. I think the Democrats do a great job of going into neighborhoods and saying, Hey, listen, we're going to give you Juneteenth. Look at what we're doing for you as a black person. We gave you Juneteenth. Look at that. You have a whole federal holiday. It cost us nothing to give it to you, but you get to feel good about having a holiday off and it's yours. We made it a national holiday. No one goes So you're telling me that nothing changed by giving Juneteenth or taking Aunt Jemima off the syrup bottle. Nothing changed? Yep. Not, no, but, nobody's lives were improved by that? Let me tell you something. The, the day after they took Aunt Jemima off the bottle, I looked at my bank account and it was exactly the same. I looked at my credit co- my credit score, and it was exactly the same. I asked around some friends. I said, hey, listen, may- maybe it's just me. You know, I have money in the bank. I have a high credit score. Maybe it's just me. What happened to you? Did your credit score go up? No, no their credit scores didn't go up either. Well, how about, you know, did you get like $1,000 or something in the bank just, just, you know, because? No, it didn't happen to me either. Well, then, how did getting Juneteenth as a federal holiday help you out in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, well, yeah, I got the day off work, you know, <laughs> so that's, you know, I think I think people on the Republican side need to really start reaching out. And this has been my frustration with the Republican Party, even though I'm not a Republican myself. You know, I, my frustration with the Republican Party has always just been no one is doing the legwork to actually go into some of these neighborhoods and go, hey, listen, vote for us. What do you have to lose? Trump was the only one who ever said it. Uh, even Lee Zeldin, who I was a fan of uh, running for governor of New York, really didn't go into enough neighborhoods and just say, hey, listen, this is what I'm looking to do for you. Right now, the current policies aren't doing anything for you. You're still in the same place. You're still going to the same stores. You're still hanging out at the same corners. They're not, well, they're not going to the same stores because the stores are leaving these areas. And some of the bodegas are still there. You know, yeah. some of the bodegas, those the bodegas aren't going anywhere. No. But uh you know, as far as like the big box stores, yeah, they're, they're picked up and leaving. They're tired of getting uh, looted. But um, no one no one from the Republican side has ever said, you know, hey, listen, we're going to do some serious outreach in these neighborhoods. Let's go in there and let's talk and let's see. There are some leaders who are starting to say, you know, hey, listen, let's let's diversify our vote. Let's go and get out there and see who else we can vote for. But has it really taken hold yet in some of these neighborhoods? I haven't seen it. Well, and I share your frustration because I've been saying that for the last decade. I've been saying that they need to go into these communities and actually listen, not lecture the voters. They need to actually listen and hear what the people say the problems are. And it's very frustrating when you're watching on TV. Now, I'm seeing people in New York City, Chicago, Baltimore. They're literally screaming at public town hall meetings about the whole illegal immigrant uh, crisis, the amount of money that's being poured and helping them. And yet their lives, they're still struggling. And yet I don't see a Republican representative standing right next to them saying, I hear your pain. I hear what you're going through. Give us, like you said, give us the chance. We're not going to do any worse. We can only do better. Give us the chance and we'll do that. D- do you think that it's because there, there's not enough people that understand these communities because they've surrendered them so long ago to Democrats? Well, one of the things I'm hopeful for with Ronna McDaniel stepping down is that the Republicans take a, a new look at, at some of these opportunities that they have 
to really get in there and take advantage that they've just dropped. I mean, you have you have a great opportunity right now with with all the illegals being put into black neighborhoods, you know, forcing black children out of schools so that they can be put into these places. You have a great opportunity to come in and say, hey, listen, we didn't vote for this. <laughs> we didn't yeah. want this. You know, this this is all for the people you voted in. These are all Democrat policies. Listen, put us in. We're going to send them back across the border. We're going to say, hey, listen, good luck. Nothing personal. We can't take 7 million people right now. So so back across the border, <laughs> you can go back back to your home country and you can apply the right way. The Republicans have a great opportunity to do all this. Rising crime in certain neighborhoods. The Republicans have a great opportunity to say, hey, listen, we're not we're, we're, we're going to go in there. We want your neighborhood safe. The last time we went in there and, and and did our thing as far as policing and you know and 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 law enforcement and safety, black lives because black lives matter, black lives were spared. The black uh, 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 living rate went up. You had money in your pocket. You like you like money in your pocket, right? Listen, the last time we were in charge, you had money in your pocket. There were businesses on every corner. Your quality of life went up. Put this back in. The Republican Party has all these opportunities to go into Chicago, New York City, St. Louis, Minneapolis. They have all these opportunities to do this, but they're not. They're dropping the ball. So, and then they wonder why they lose elections. So, yeah. I mean, listen, like like I said, I, I'm an independent voter. I, uh, I I have my issues with both the Democrats and the Republicans. The Republicans, it's more it's just like you're, you're, you're weak. You don't know how to fight. But uh, this is a prime opportunity to get in there and actually do something, and they're dropping the ball. And that's why I, I like people like uh, like like Scott Peterson who just go in there and, and they, they they do their thing. So I, we need more of that. And, and just on a broader level, what surprises you most about American culture today? I mean, we're, we're nearly the same age. So when you look at how, how we grew up in the America we grew up in, I mean, to me, it's dramatically different. And I have two kids that sadly will not grow up in the same America that I grew up in. What's your thoughts on where we are as a culture today where, you know, being a man is actually taboo, that it's toxic masculinity, that they're teaching kids, uh, boys to be feminine, they're teaching gender, that anyone could be any gender they want. Like, did you ever envision that we'd be in this position and have these debates today? Not at all. Remember that that line from Kindergarten Cop with uh, the, the little kid? And he said, Boys have penises and girls have vaginas. I do. There's, there's no way <laughs> he'd be able to say that line today without a bunch of leftists all going, "Hey, whoa, whoa, hey, hey, that's 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 hateful speech." You know, that's <laughs> you can't say that. You know, or just the fact that just the fact that uh, uh, you have someone like me, like I'm six two, I'm two hundred sixty five pounds, and, and people want to put you know, I I can just decide one day, hey, listen, my name is Michelle. And I'm gonna put myself on a girls' basketball team or a girls' rugby team, and I'm just I'm just gonna go in there because I today I feel I feel feminine, I feel pretty today, you know, or or, or just the fact that you've got teachers, you know, teachers they, their job used to just be to teach, there was no hidden agenda, there was nothing else. Your job is to teach, and they now are activists. They want to put all their ideas and all their thoughts and and all their opinions. On kids, you know, thinking back, I, the first activist teacher I ever ran to was my seventh grade teacher, who she was, she saw herself as, as an activist. And a lot of her ideas were shut down because a lot of the parents said, you know what, all, all this stuff you're doing, we're, we're not cool with that. We're not cool with that. And she was shut down. Nowadays, the parents are all like, you know, either the parents don't care or the teachers unions are, are saying, oh, no, but she has a right to, to put a bunch of flags in her classroom and has a had, had, you know, that she's going to take time out of every day to to lecture the students about, you know, what it is to be black. You Typically, this is the white woman doing this, but she's going to lecture. Interesting, the students, isn't it? She's going to lecture the students on, on how to be black. You know, uh, now you have to really be involved in your children's lives nowadays. You can't let the schools get away with whatever they want. You can't let even uh, their friends' parents get away with whatever they want. You have to know who your children are playing with. You have to be so much more involved. You know, 
Uh, you, you can't, can't even th- let them watch cartoons on their own without knowing what the cartoons are. That's how bad it's gotten. No, you can't. My my daughter's eight years old, and she's got a rule. If if you know whatever she's watching, we have to know what she's watching. There there is no channel surfing. There is no like you know she loves YouTube because she loves watching uh, dance competitions and stuff like that. And we have a rule. There's no you you can watch these specific channels, but there's no surfing. There's no going around and just seeing what you can find because there there was there were a couple of uh, 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 cartoons I caught. That she was watching i was like whoa hey, hey you know hey what, what do you you know you can't you can't watch that you know so you know you have to turn it off you have to mute those channels but you know you, you have to be so much involved because nowadays there's just so many landmines and they weren't before i shared a meme on my instagram page a, a day or two ago it showed a whole bunch of older uh, uh women older black grandmother type women and they, they all had the church hats and they all were kind of just giving the camera a look and uh, it, on the bottom, it said, before the cops, before anybody else, this was the law and order in the neighborhood. <laughs> and I said, 100% correct. You were more afraid of, of, you know, Aunt Esther down the street knowing what you did because she might give you a beating. And then once she told uh, Miss, Miss Clara down, down the other side of the street, Miss Clara might give you a beating, you know. So, I mean, you know, but that's, that doesn't happen nowadays. So, I mean, it's just, you know, you've got you got a, a complete devolving of just society that's going on and it needs to come back. Yeah, it's really sad and pathetic. And, and Zeke, where can people follow you? I'm on uh, my main account is Twitter, Zeke Arkham, Z-E-E-K-A-R-K-H-A-M. Same handle on Instagram where I do a lot of my video commentary, Z-E-E-K-A-R-K-H-A-M. Uh, and we're going to have links up at the PAS report. I really appreciate you speaking out because uh, you're a unique voice in this mix, in this cesspool that we call social media. So I want to thank you for coming on. I enjoyed you speaking out and I'd love to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thank you.